The Wednesday Week is sponsored by Bentoria.com. That's B E N T O R I A.com. <laughs> gentlemen and a very warm welcome to the Wednesday week, the uh, Sheffield Wednesday podcast. I'm Lord Hillsborough and with me on the line, first of all, we've got Eddie. Hello there, Eddie, old boy. Stop placing, time wasting, I got a friend with a pole in the basement. I'm just kidding like Jason, unless you're going to do it. <laughs> we've all got a friend with a pole in the basement, old boy. Or as we say, seller for us normal folks. And of course, on the line as well, we've got James. Hello there, James, old boy. Hello, very excited tonight. Um, firstly, for the first time, I am doing the podcast with an actual muff, uh, which is very <laughs> exciting. Um, but also got to mention, I'm the only member of the podcast crew not planning to get tickets to see Justin Bieber, it would seem. Um, and I mean, it's not that I'm not a fan. I just choose to enjoy Justin privately in my own special way. There's a lawsuit if you accuse me of that again, James. That's that's clear slander. Uh... <laughs> Lord, you, you sound you sound a little poorly this week. Are you are you not too well? I'm slightly bunged up, all being but being the, the little trooper that I am, we shall crack on. Um, it's just a shame the uh, the lads couldn't do the same, isn't it? Uh, but we'll <laughs> get to that, shall we? Um, so first things first, uh, let's have a little chat about the uh, the little slight tiny glimmer of hope this week which was the uh, the Cardiff game which quite simply didn't start too well did it? No, it's it's a bit of a weird one this it's the first game this season that I haven't seen uh, with the exception of the majority of the QPR away game uh, <laughs> thanks to our beanbag policy of not actually showing the the match um, so it was my work due on um, on Saturday in Doncaster uh, so I couldn't I couldn't get to um, get to Cardiff. So I, I listened to it on the radio, and it's so hard to judge. I forget how much different it is listening to a football match on the radio to actually being there and and seeing it in person. Because um, it sounded like we played all right. We we gave away silly goals. Uh, you know we could have lost the match. We could have won the match. In the end, it was a draw. You can't really tell from um, from radio commentary. Now, I actually met up with a mate of mine, uh, Chris Shelley, at uh, Milton Keynes last night. So, uh, big up to Chris. Everyone say hi, Chris. Hi, Chris. Hey, Chris. Very good. Uh, so, Chris was at the Cardiff match, and um, I didn't get a chance to have a chat with him before the game. The idea was that I was going to record a little, uh, little piece with him, and that he could give us some actual reaction from someone that was at the game. Um, so, didn't have a chance before the MK Dons match, so we said, oh, we'll meet at half-time and we'll do it then. Now, obviously... Quite a bit happened in the first half of the MK Dons match. So by the time it came to half time, firstly, we just wanted beer to try and take away the pain. And secondly, we didn't really want to talk about the Cardiff match. So, yeah, to cut a long story short, the chat about the Cardiff match didn't happen. But he, he did tell me that kind of the consensus seemed to be that we'd, we'd played pretty well, that we deserved something out of the game. And that actually, in, in all reality, we probably should have won it. I think we were probably the better team. Um, I think we've all seen the goals back on. TV and 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 you know West Westwood was definitely at fault for the first. I can't criticise Kieran Westwood. You know he's been amazing for the last eighteen months. He there was no need for him to go for for that, and it, it gave away a penalty. It gave away a goal. We we can't hold it against him. Um, the uh, the second goal again seemed like fairly sloppy defending. Offside trap didn't really work. Uh, but look, you know, we got back into the match, didn't we? We got the goals that we needed, and credit to uh, Forestieri again. A moment of just absolute individual brilliance that gets us back into the game. Um, and really pleased as well for Baza, uh, getting his first goal uh, and very richly deserved as well. Final. So, you know, overall, decent performance, let down by some silly defending, which puts us up against it. At, at the end of the day, you probably say it's a good point. If this was the only game that we had to review, let's just pretend that Tuesday night didn't happen. I actually think we'd be we'd be feeling pretty positive we'd look at the fact that we've taken a point away at a, a team that is battling at exactly the same part of the table that we're at um 
And the comeback from 2-0 down, I think, showed everything that has been good about Sheffield Wednesday this season. Um, I think you're right that we were probably a little bit unlucky, albeit self-inflicted wounds, that we were 2-0 down at the break. Um, but these things happen in football. You know, if our players never made mistakes, they wouldn't be playing at Sheffield Wednesday in the Championship right now. So... Uh, I can forgive Kieran Westwood because 98% of the time he's excellent. That was the first time he's really done something boneheaded um, that you could you could level at him. So that was disappointing, but it's understandable. The offside trap is an offside trap. You know, I think we played uh, a high back line for that ball. It didn't work. We got punished for it. So it was disappointing to be 2-0 down because I think we'd given a good account of ourselves. And I think most neutrals, are, you know, and I'm not one, but I think most neutrals would accept that we were probably the, the more creative team, the more dangerous team in the first half. Um, so to go from 2-0 down and to battle back to 2-2, I think showed the best of what this team can achieve. And again, we, we point to them every week, Forest Airy took the, the game by the scruff of the neck. Absolutely. Barry Bannon did exactly what he's been doing uh, all season long. The team responded really, really well to that. And for us to get away with a 2-2 draw that could quite easily have been three points. And at the same time, I accept that you know Cardiff had their moments. They're a decent team. It could have gone the other way as well. But for us to get away with a 2-2 draw, I think was A, a fair result, given the balance of play. And I think B, showed what, Sheffield Wednesday under Carlos Cavalial in 2015 have been all about. So taking that in isolation, I came away feeling pretty positive, albeit with a little bit of a niggle in the back of my mind saying, you know what, we have done an awful lot of hard work over the last half a dozen games and we haven't had the points total to show for it that maybe performances that haven't quite been as good we came away with three points earlier on in the season. And that, it, it left me a little bit on edge going into Tuesday night's game. But taken on its own, I think Cardiff was a, a, a decent display. And I think all Wednesday fans should have regarded that as a solid platform to carry on and build to, you know, for, for where we are in the table at the moment. And I think a lot of us did, and I think that's probably why, um, going on to the next game, Archers were um, a little disappointed, shall we say, um, with uh, what's happened um, next. However, um, again, concentrating on the Cardiff game just for the moment. It, it, again, it's nice to see we had this sort of a, a battling spirit. Of course, one of the people that was battling for a short amount of time was Hutch, and of course, he's out injured again now. Um, managed to escape the game without a yellow card, um, <laughs> luckily enough, but uh, it's, it's just another big loss isn't it another game another knock and uh, another Sheffield Wednesday team slightly depleted I tell you something we um we are not the same team without Hutchinson in it not not by any stretch of the imagination um you know we we miss him so so much and I don't think it's not even a question of whether or not we can get you know someone in who who acts as kind of more appropriate cover because, yeah, you know, Hutch, Hutch is going to be injured for some games each season. He's going to be suspended. You know, another five bookings, it's a three-match suspension for him. And I think probably the record for the most bookings ever in the championship or something. And, and, and you know, we've got, we've got to be, uh, we, we've, we've got to expect that. Um, I don't think that you can go out and buy anyone that is like Sam Hutchinson because they're playing in the Premier League. They're, they're not playing at this level. You're absolutely right. And I just, I don't, it's, it's hard. It's almost like... Um, it's a blessing in disguise having a player like Hutch. He's brilliant, but when he's not there, God, it just feels like our team just crumbles, uh, and we just we really, really struggle without him. And it's something that's really starting to concern me now because I just don't know what what we do. You know, we'll come on and we'll we'll talk about Tuesday in in a bit. You know, it was it was an area where you could just see that we 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 just weren't competing, and without Hutch there, we we aren't the same. Knowing what we know now about how we perform with Hutch versus without Hutch. If Mr Chancery um, is going to, to to invest in January, do we actually feel that the most pressing need is a, 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 an enforcer, a, a, a water carrier, everything that Hutch does because he's fantastic, do we need a central midfielder that we can anchor our en entire team around even more 
often we need a striker that's going to fire the goals that will get us to where we need to be. I, I, don't, I mean, it's probably not the best day for us to be kind of having that conversation because it feels like off the back of last night that we need quite a bit. Um, so whether or not that that is kind of top of the shopping list, I don't know. I mean, it does seem like, you know, games in the championship are won and lost in midfield and those games where we're, we're just not up to it. And, and, you know, we were outplayed in midfield by MK Dons last night and that shouldn't be happening. There's a fair argument there, isn't there, to say that that's an area that we've got to get right. And defensive midfield is so important. You know, you see the, the, the best teams in the Premier League have, you know, good, solid central defensive midfielders in fact you know a lot of them play two players in that in that position and at the moment we've only really got one player that's that's really up to it and it, it probably if we're serious about a promotion push we're going to need someone else in there aren't we it looks like the difference to me between where we are right now and i'm not saying this because of, of tuesday night so I, i'm not one of these who, who swings like a weather vane in the breeze i it seems to me increasingly apparent that the difference between us and the teams that are at the very top of this division is the spine of the team. And I think there's an argument to say that Westwood is more than good enough. There's an argument to say that our central defensive pairing is good enough if one of those is Tom Lees. And mm -hmm. I think that was a big miss on Tuesday night. Okay. And I think it's important to recognise how a crucial Hutch has proven that, that he can be because we aren't as good with either Samido or Lopez playing that role. And then we've talked endlessly about um, what we need at striker. And actually, I, I'm, I've got some, some optimistic points of view uh, relating to last night regarding Gary Hooper. But what is clear is that no matter what else happens on the flanks of the team and in the depth that any team has, Every successful team in this division and probably every division in football can count on the spine of the team being there for 90% of the time. And unfortunately for us, two of those major cogs have, uh, you know, through injury, through suspension, uh, just haven't been there for us. And you see the difference when it comes to the results that we get. Do you, do you think that the teams that are kind of at the at the top end of the championship, the the difference is, because I think the spine of our team is as good as the spine of Middlesbrough's team or yeah. Brighton's team of, of Derby's team. Um, I, I, our problem is that we've not had the luck in terms of injuries um, and, and they've still got the spine of their team there. Is, is that the only difference? You know, if, if they lost, if Derby lose Bradley Johnson to injury for six weeks, do they have someone that can come in and do that role as well? No, I, I, I absolutely think you're right. I think that maybe other teams haven't had to um, to lean on the depth of their squad as much as we have in those key positions. Uh, so no, I think if if Middlesbrough lose um, a, you know a Gibson or a friend or a Grant Ledbetter or a, a Stuart Downing, you know they they are players of real quality. I think our players of real quality stand up to them. But the fact is that we. You know, we have struggled to replace those players. I don't really care what happens with other teams, you know, but it looks to me like Middlesbrough certainly have been able to field a really settled side and that's why they're, why they're top of this division at the moment. Yep, agreed. Of course, we do have to sort of uh, point out the, the good points uh, of Cardiff as well. I think uh, Carlos's tactical switch at half-time did make it a big difference as well. Uh, of course, the chap um, <laughs> said it rather oddly himself. Um, as they say in Portugal, we put our meat on the fire in that second half. Um, We've all done that. Oh, I'll tell you what, the times my meat's been on the fire. <laughs> That's good, well, honestly, the best thing I've ever heard any football manager say ever. Um, <laughs> but uh, not a clue what it means but by all means Carlos keep throwing it on there old boy if that's what's going to happen um unfortunately it looks like it uh, it was more sort of um scabby hot dogs in the in the boiling pan for MK and Dons doesn't it <laughs> I don't think there has been a better segue in any sports podcast <laughs> in history <laughs> using the phrase scabby hot dogs to describe our performance against MK Dons I've been working on that all week oh boy <laughs> Okay, um, I've made a lot of notes about this, and I'm probably going to talk for quite a lot now. 
And I'm going to edit it. Don't worry, chaps. Just yeah, do, so with the, us. The maybe <laughs> when as you listen to this, it may not seem as long as I'm uh, making it sound like because large chunks will be taken out. <laughs> um, because I've got, you know, my brain over the last 24 hours has just been spewing out a lot of thoughts. And I've tried to kind of um, put them in some kind of order to make some kind of sense. But right, okay, so here goes. Um, o- o- overall, it was, you know, a fairly miserable evening. And, and I'll start right at the beginning. I went in a car with uh, two Wednesday fans and one MK Dons fan who lives in Sheffield. Um, so, you know, that's not the best of start. The traffic getting out of Sheffield was awful. You know, we, it looked almost certain that we were going to miss kick off um thanks to my friend tom's shall we say creative driving we made it in time for kickoff which is good um we, we were up in the top tier of stadium mk um it, it's a pretty bland stadium it's fairly soulless there wasn't really much of an atmosphere there was a little rumble of an atmosphere among the wednesday nights at the start of the game but it, it didn't really last very long and i don't think i heard a single, even when MK Don scored, I wasn't, until they played the goal music, I wasn't even sure if it had been given because you just, I couldn't hear a thing from them uh, at all. Right, the game itself. The, it, do you know what? It was absolutely the game that I feared it was. I said on the podcast last week, we just don't seem to do very well when we go to places like that. When when on paper, it looks like a game that we should walk, we, we seem to struggle. It happened at Charlton. It happened last night. You know, David Garrido said last week, Oh, you know, it won't be like it was at Charlton. You know, this is a game that we can go and win. It, it just felt exactly the same as the um, as the Charlton game, and it, it's starting to become a little bit of a um, it's like a curse, really. I, I, you know, every time we say, "Oh, you know, this should be a straightforward win," that's it. We've we've had it. Oh, every time David Greedo says this will be, a straightforward yeah, blame it. I did I did text him actually during the match saying, <laughs> "I'm blaming this on you," uh, and he texted me back after the game. Just with the just with OMG and then about five question marks. Now I'd had a few drinks and I misinterpreted this and I said I was only joking, mate. I wasn't having a real go. And he was like, "No, that was a reaction to the performance." <laughs> we're, we're still mates. It's all right. Um, right, first five minutes Phew. we looked we looked all right. First five minutes, then everything went wrong. It was it was a really poor first half performance, and I don't really know what to say to kind of flower that up because there isn't anything to flower up it was a poor first half performance uh we started the second half much brighter um when they got the second it all fell a little bit flat but we did play better after that it felt like we'd lost the game but there was still a long time to go and you just kind of yeah maybe if we if we got that goal back quite early on in the second half it it would have been a little bit different it didn't feel like we were on the verge of, of of an amazing comeback and turning that that game round um i thought really across the board everyone played pretty pretty poor uh bannon had you know a decent game and i think a couple of our subs that came on they they played fairly well as well i know eddie you you mentioned a little bit about hooper you're going to talk about him in a bit i thought he looked really bright uh right the the prop the problem for me was midfield we looked sloppy mk dons don't have a great midfield it's certainly not the worst in the league but you know they've got darren potter in there and, and that is all you really need to say about it. And they control things in, in midfield for the majority of that match. Kieran Lee was pretty anonymous in the first half. Sugu you know, might as well not really been on the pitch. Um, you, you, MK Dons didn't have to be amazing to control the midfield. And that, for me, is a real, real problem. Um, we did our what seems to be our usual thing now of giving our opponents a two-goal lead before we actually figured out how we need to play you know for 45 minutes we just were we, we might as well have not been on that football pitch it, it took us until half time for carlos to figure out what the right team was right, what the right formation was and what changes he needed to make for us to actually start to look a little bit more like a football team and, and we've got to stop doing that you can't you're not going to win games when you're giving your opponents a, a two goal start it's just not going to happen Mentioned Hooper, really pleased for him. Um, he looked a lot sharper. He deserved the goal. He put himself about. He looked dangerous. You know, I, I really hope it's the start of something for him. Um, what I'm not, what I don't really want to do, and I've probably done it a little bit, and I didn't want to do this, is kind of go through the team and, and slate them all because it was one game and they don't deserve that. You know, th- there's no one who, who was on the pitch last night that's been consistently poor all season and therefore deserves a little bit of a slating. Um, if... I think on, on social media, a lot of people have been um, singling out Atty and giving him a, some real stick about last night, probably with good reason. But, you know, look, we, we were poor and they deserve to win the game. 
I'm going to try and be a little positive now because that's what I do. Uh, there was a point in the second half where I can't remember what happened, but there was a point in the second half we had a shot. I think it got t- took a deflection, went wide, and I, I turned to I think it was my mate Tom that was was stood next to me, and I said, "Do you know what? This is just one of those games. We're not getting the bounce of the ball. You know, nothing's going our way. Um, you, you get those games where you just get that lucky bounce, and you know, you get that decision that goes in your favour." And from being 2 0 down, next thing you know, you're 3 2 up. You know, every, every team can say that after they've lost a the game, but on a, on a different day, it's a different story. So I think what we've got to do is not get carried away and start thinking this is the end of the world. You know, we don't need to sack the manager. We've not been uh, immediately relegated to League Two for the next 10 years or anything like that. Um, I, I've got to talk a little bit about the referee, and I don't, this is not something that I very often do because I think over the course of the season, it levels itself out, and we all look at referees with blue and white tinted spectacles, don't we? And we we slate them sometimes when actually they've, they've probably been all right. That referee last night was terrible. But that referee Awful. last night was Darren Deadman, which we all know. You know well, he, <laughs> he does have a bit of a rep, doesn't he, for being pretty terrible. I mean, I've I've it, it's got to rank in the top five worst refereeing performance that I've ever actually witnessed while being at a football game. You know, he just, he, 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 he was blatant fouls that he wasn't giving. Uh, he was giving some very strange decisions that were going against us. Um, just just really, really bad. And, um, you know, that for me just falls into this category on a different day, a different ref. It could have been a different story that and we could be having a different conversation um, now. Um, if, if I was to try and offer some kind of actual analysis rather than just ranting, and I sort of touched on this a little bit <laughs> earlier on, um, I think the problem that we that we had on Tuesday was that we didn't look prepared. And this is something that I think is cropping up as a little bit of a pattern now with, with games, that we're having to fall two goals behind before we're figuring out what formation and what players we need to actually be able to get something out of the game. You know, it was obvious last week that it, sorry, last, last night, that it, it wasn't working, but it still took us until half time to really kind of sort that out and do something about it. There's a criticism that you can level uh, at Carlos Carvalhal for the way that he he lined us up and prepared us for MK Dons. I think you're absolutely right that it, this wasn't the game to start with a kind of you know Lopez Sugu axis for you know for those guys to be the ones that they're expected to step in and um, and not only protect a, a back four where you've got you know Michael Turner coming back. Um, but to, to, to go ahead and, and, and do things. And it almost felt like Carlos was saying, well, you know, this, this game is a game that we expect to win, so it doesn't really matter what team I put out there. I actually think that starting with Lopez was c- completely at odds with what this game needed, both from a tactical standpoint of what MK Dons were going to do, but also the fact that it's a Tuesday night in December. Um, you know, this is it, without dropping into lazy stereotyping of European players. This was one of the one of those games where you absolutely need just a bastard in midfield. To you know, a, a Hutchinson would have been perfect, but a Semedo would do absolutely amazing in spoiling the game plan of MK Dons for the first half an hour to the point where they get bored uh, you know, and capitulate to us. Carlos, I think, showed a, a degree of naivety, which hasn't happened too much this season. Uh, but I think that he, he approached this like it was a Saturday afternoon game in October. And he's been so successful at picking the right team for circumstances there. Uh, I, I think it's a, an important lesson learned and I hope it's one that you know he will now sit down and think. Actually, it's horses for courses here, as opposed to let's just pick the best eleven players that we've got in the squad. Yeah, I just, absolutely couldn't agree more with that. Um, and and you know what? I mean, the thing is, it, it's it's a defeat. We lost. It doesn't really matter if we lost two one or five nil, does it? You yeah. Know, we get zero points. We know that we've got to do better. Um, as fans, I think we've got to trust Carlos. We've got to trust the team that he's got around him. We've got to trust the players to be able to do that uh, and not sit around licking our wounds and feeling sorry for us because, yeah, we went all the way to Milton Keynes on a Tuesday night and it was a bit shit. You know what? It, it happens. Let's not worry about it. We we lost. Forget about it. It's been a great season so far. It's been really exciting. You know, rewind 12 months and we were having a really boring season. You know, this is this is a fun season for us to be involved in. And, um, you know, it's 
it's about keeping the faith. It's about the fact that we've got to say, right, we're going to go out on Sunday. We're going to smash Wolves. That's that's the response. That's what needs to happen. And we can forget all about the fact that last night happened. And we'll all be very glad to um, to do that. Um, just another couple of very quick things about MK Dons. Firstly, I think the Twitter meltdown that's happened since has been absolutely ridiculous. Uh, we're a work in progress. No one ever said that we were going to walk the league this season. And I think we've lost two in the last, whatever it is, 15 games or something stupid in the league. So I think the fact that some, some of the reactions being been crazy and people really need to have a bit of a look at themselves. Um, fair play to Jack Hunt, who tweeted to say that it was an embarrassing performance. He, he was pretty poor last night, Jack Hunt. Fair play for, for holding his hands up publicly and saying that. Um, and finally, uh, despite having someone from Milton Keynes in the car, having the sat nav on and the ridiculously simple grid system that is Milton Keynes, uh, we even got lost on the way away from the, um, the stadium, which just about summed up the evening. And with that, I have finished. Oh, no. Jeeves, we're going to need some more equipment. Then you need to speak to Oddballs, a speciality. What the? Oddballs, a speciality dealing steel, food, and engineering equipment. Where is that voice coming from? We offer great deals on all types of equipment and can include dismantling, delivery, and erection anywhere in the world. Did he just say erection? We can also buy your surplus equipment or sell it on commission. With over 30 years' experience, let us achieve the best deal for you. Where can I find out more of Voice in the Sky? Go to www.bentoria.com You heard him, folks. Jeeves, get a broom. Um, right then, ladies and gents. So let's crack on with some Wednesday news and um, a little bit of good news for everybody. Um, we've had a, a little knock at the door. Our, our little late comer is here. Um, who's there? This show gets more increasingly like Noel's house party <laughs> by the day, doesn't it? I, just call me Bob Monkhouse. We do seem to have somewhat of an open door policy just recently. Uh, people yeah. just appearing in there and everywhere. But of course, it's always a pleasure to, to for you to appear, Fudgy. Oh boy. How's it going, team? Anyway, you all right? How's, uh, how's everybody after a chilly night down at Milton King? Do you all have a good time? Yeah, oh, it's, uh, apparently a good time was had by. No one. Uh, right, so let's crack on, shall we, with the, the sparse little bit of Wednesday news that we do have this week. It's uh, There's not been a great deal that's come out. Um, first thing is um, fantastic news, hopefully. Um, there's been the rumours and the um, sort of uh, little snippets from the chap himself, but apparently Bannon is ready to sign a long-term contract, which is something we've been waiting for for chuffing ages, isn't he? Yay! We could do with it, couldn't we? You know, the, you feel like the, you know, that roller coaster of emotion and all the positivity, it's kind of spiralling a little bit out of control at the moment. It would be great for us to be able to announce something like that. If he's enjoying playing at Sheffield Wednesday, then we are more than enjoying having him here because uh, he is one of those building blocks of the team that we want to put on the pitch, isn't he? He's um, he's not at the best of times, has he, at some of the clubs that he's been at? Um, and it's kind of hard. It's sort of hard for us to see it because he's been almost from the first you know minute that he played for us, he's been really good. But he's you know he's been a couple of places where it's not really worked for him. The fans haven't really taken to him, um, and I think he's had a bit of a hard time. And I think he's really um, enjoying his football. He likes being somewhere where he feels appreciated um you know the the work rate that the guy puts in and even last night you know he was the one person that was chasing everything running you know up and down all over the pitch but you know we've just got to get him we've got to get him tied down to that contract because this this guy not only has a massive role to play in our team as it is now but you know let's just say if we do reach the dizzy heights of the premier league within the next couple of years he's he's good enough to play at that level Absolutely. Uh, I mean, there's been a few things that have pointed towards this happening. The first one was a tweet that uh, Bannon sent out himself saying that his garden's finished. And after all that work, you're not going to be up at sticks and moving after all sorting your garden out, are you? And secondly, I mean, not to sort of blow my own trumpet, I have people to do that for me. But, um, of course, there was a Bannon song on last week's podcast. So quite clearly, he's appreciated that and thought, you know what? I'm going to stay here. I like these people. Um, another little I, I, I got no No, no. No, normally when you do a song, they normally leave. Shh, we, we, we're not mentioning that. They don't tend to leave. No, but, but, they just on, tend to, to fair, turn it, really bad. I'm trying to be positive here, but it's not been a very positive week. Oh, well, I, I, I agree with the lads, don't get me wrong. He is an absolute tremendous player and, and one of the cornerstone first names on the team sheet thing. But I'm kind of annoyed with Rob starting about it all because there's not a story there. 
Do you know what I mean? There's nothing set in stone. There's nobody's actually confirmed anything. It's just textbook newspaper talk. And then Dom Housen thought, aye, aye, chicken pie. You know, <laughs> me, me and my chin, you can get a credit card swipe through. You know, <laughs> he's control v it as well. Do you know, there's not a story there. And it's kind of, and, and it would have been a great thing for the club to announce, you know, to go, ladies and gentlemen, look, the player have been singing his name all season and, and on the podcast and whatnot. Hey, it's, it's Barry Banan. Ba 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 banan. You know what I mean? And it'd have been brilliant. It'd be great fanfare for the club. And, and Rob Statton's kind of ruined that for everybody, hasn't he? Do you know what? It's good to have you back, Fudge. <laughs> it really is, old boy. I bet I, I think it's just after this week, if we didn't have that little glimmer of, of hope, I, I think I'd be somewhat despairing more than I am at the moment, if I'm honest. Um, another uh, sort of little bit of good news. Oh, oh, in fact, let me ask if you guys think this is good news. Uh, Michael Turner has also sort of. Um, hinted that he would like to um, stay at Sheffield Wednesday long term as well of course he's uh, on along with us at the moment from Norwich until the end of the season um, he has got a sort of a 12 month option on his contract at Norwich for next uh, which expires next summer um, but um, he's sort of made noises about staying at the Wednesday I mean he's 32 now I mean is this the kind of sort of player you'd like to see stay another year or, or maybe two or, or do you think we need to be sort of looking for a, a permanent um what should we say, fixture next to, to next to Mr Lee? It's 100% good news. Um, and you're right, we do need to find a permanent partner for Tom Lees because Tom Lees is the future and the present of this back four. However, um, in the meantime, we need players who have quality, quality enough to hang at the top end of this division. Glenn Leuvens has it, Michael Turner has it. Right. As much as Vincent Sasso is one of the most beautiful men who has ever pulled on the blue and white, <laughs> he is yet to prove that he has the chops to do that. And so, therefore, the idea that a Michael Turner wants to make a more permanent relationship with Sheffield Wednesday should be applauded. It should be encouraged. And we should not get ideas that somehow, um, you know, we... we we don't want these, you know, these loan players, these hired hands, etc. Until we find, uh, um, it's a terrible analogy, but a Gary Cahill to to Lees's John Terry, and that doesn't make any sense. But uh, we, what we need <laughs> is we need players who can fill in until we find a central defensive pairing that is going to be, you know, for the next five, ten years, the the bedrock of Sheffield Wednesday Football Club. So yes, two thumbs up for the idea of getting Michael Turner on a longer term deal. Can, can I just say on the, on the back of that, um, and it's a little bit off subject this, because I, I do agree that I think that Turner, I mean, he was he was actually pretty solid last night. I thought he had, a, he, out of everyone, he, he had a pretty good game at uh, MK. Um, but playing two 32-year-old central defenders together, which we've done for the last two games, and that's two consecutive games where our offside trap hasn't worked and we've given away a, a, a goal. It, it's making me a tad nervous, this. And I, I'm, I'm starting to feel that it's something that we've really got to treat as a priority in January to to find and bring in who that person's going to be that plays alongside Tom Lees. I'm just not sure whether two central defenders who are, I'm, you know, say in the... In in the twilight of their career, if that's a fair phrase, mm -hmm. I just I don't know if it works at this level. We've got we've got found out twice playing an offside trap, and we can't keep doing that. Uh, football's moved on, but uh, you know Pearson and Shirtliff, that you know that worked. That wasn't that wasn't a problem. Yeah, okay, I take the point that pace is very very important, but I don't think we should get hung up on age necessarily, because even you know we've we've had great centre backs who have played into their mid thirties and. Even if they have lost a yard of pace, and to be honest, I don't think either of those two players um, ever really made their money because of the pace they had. Yeah. It, you know, it's important to 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 find a centre back pairing that does everything else really well. I'm not worried about having 32 year old centre backs. What I'm worried about is having players of real quality in what are the key positions, like we've talked about, the spine of the team. I I. I... I agree with not paying too much credence to their age. I, I say we get rid of him, I, you know, because I think he, he came in on the crest of a wave when we were looking to bolster our ranks when when he knew that Sheffield Wednesday had a few quid. And for me personally, I think he's on the best contract he can possibly get right now. I think he was on the fringe at Norwich and essentially 
he's on the fringe in terms of our, our pecking order at centre halves as well. And I think um, I think this is the best contract he can possibly get. And uh, and that's why he's making noises about staying because if, if he doesn't, he's going to end up turning out in some League One outfit at the top of the league like Wigan. I know that's harsh, but I'm 35 and I play centre back and I, you know, should see me go. <laughs> <laughs> We've all seen videos of you going, Fudge. Uh, <laughs> But I think it does sort of speak to a, a bigger question for, for this particular season, if you like. We know that there's been massive swaying changes at, at Sheffield Wednesday this, this season. Um, we, we all hope that we, we sort of creep, and maybe some expect to, to sort of creep into that um, that playoff spot uh, by the end of the season. But I, I'm, I'm as guilty as this as anybody. After the match last night, I sent out a tweet myself that said that in the uh, the January transfer window, we've got to go out and spend some of our tuna bucks on sort of grabbing a, a, a striker that we know is going to put goals in the net. Or less. And, and then as soon as I pressed send on that tweet, I thought, you know what? Maybe, 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 maybe. I know we said this a lot last season, but this season is, is something that we just need to lay foundations for. We're, we're going to pay over the odds for players in January. So if we, we do need a centre-back, a centre midfielder and a striker in the January transfer window, it's going to cost us a bloody fortune to do that. Is it worth, sort of pay, playing devil's advocate if you like, is it worth sort of holding and, 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 and firming down what we've got at the moment and then come the end of this season, then picking out the prime cuts, if you like, of what exactly we need? Um, or do you really think we should just be going out in January and just splashing the cash again? Um, I think that's a fair point and it's well made. Um, we're, we're talking here on Wednesday evening after... You know, witnessing a, a, a you know fairly dire performance on the Tuesday night. So right now, I kind of feel like yeah, we've we've got you know there's there's two or three areas that we desperately need some improvement in, and so I want us to go out and buy them in January. Of course I do. You're absolutely right. You know, this was never going to, and I said this earlier, it was never going to be a season where we were going to storm the league. And anyone that that really thought that is being silly. Um, should we pay five million pound more for a player? in January when we could get someone, you know, of, of equal quality for a lot less in, um, in the summer, it, it doesn't make a lot of, it doesn't make a lot of sense from a business point of view, but I just, what I don't want is I don't want this season to peter out into being a bland mid table, not really ever kind of making much of a push towards the top six, but never in danger of dropping down towards the bottom end of the table season. I, I agree with you, but uh, I mean, it's what comes with that with that five million quid. I mean, you've got these, is it balloon payments now? Is it something that, there's something happening this year with the money. I, I don't know the ins and outs of it, but if you get promoted this season, it's a hell of a payday. And yeah. let's say we spend an absolute boatload of cash on, on a, on a centre half that stop, shows it up one end. And, you know, if the goals stop coming in, people like Yao, people, oh, sorry, Joao, and, um, <laughs> and, and Hoops and, and the rest of them, you know, might start might start knocking them in because we, we've spent the money showing it up at the back. Me personally, you either go. My my thoughts on it is you either go for it or you don't. I've really changed my opinion on what this squad needs in the last few weeks. Actually, I've kind of had an awakening on this one. I really feel like we have the strikers who can do the job for us between now and May and do enough to uh, to win us games and get us where we need to be, whether that's the top six or, or, or whatever. Actually, it's those injuries that we've talked about to Tom Lees and the injury suspensions to Sam Hutchison. I actually believe that what we really need is depth at virtually every other position to ensure that we're still super solid at the back to ensure that we're still, we still have the right balance of bite and creativity in midfield. Because actually, every one of the strikers that we have turned out this season, yes, even Atty Nuiu, who is, is coming for dog's abuse in the last 24 hours on the forums, etc. Every one of those has shown that with um, a level of service and with uh, you know, a following wind can score easily in this division. So... I'm really enthused about Gary Hooper. The last 90 minutes he has played has been excellent for Sheffield Wednesday. I don't think that anyone's under any 
uh, doubt that Fernando Forestieri can hack it as a top, top striker at this level. I think Lucas Joao has proven that he can do exactly what he needs to do. And, and Ati Nuyu as well has done exactly the same thing. So, you know what? I actually, if we're going to spend money in January, I would sooner it be ensuring that when we lose some of those key players who do everything else, so Bannon, sorry, Bernan, so Bernan, so Forestieri, so Hutchinson, so Lees, and Westwood necessarily, although I think we've got a fantastic backup for Westwood. We need to ensure that our level of performance doesn't drop from the supporting cast that are delivering the, the magazines full of bullets for those guys to fire. Yeah, it's, it's one of those things. I mean, I wasn't really expecting promotion this season, if I'm perfectly honest. Uh, next season, if we're not there, thereabouts in uh, sort of uh, automatic promotion spots, then I would be incredibly disappointed. But uh, uh, we'll, we'll just see what Carlos and uh, Mr. Chan Siri uh, come up with. Uh, so let's uh, crack on then, shall we? And uh, James, I believe you've got a few uh, little bits for us, old boy. I do love James. A little bit. I've, I've actually only got one this week, which is um, odd, a, a, a worry. Um, <laughs> yeah, it's been quiet, hasn't it? This last seven days, there's not been. Normally, there's like two or three posts on Twitter that you think, ah, oh, yeah, that's that's. I can get something out of that. There's only been one thing that I've seen on Twitter this week that's really taken my eye, um, and that is the legend that is Sean McCauley, uh, who is now assistant manager at the <laughs> Portland Timbers in the states, which does sound. Like it should be like a DIY company or something. Um, you, you may have seen this. There's a brilliant video that's that's doing the rounds on the internet of him singing "Don't Stop Believing" by Journey um, on the mic on the pitch uh, during the uh, Portland Timbers Championship Rally. If you've not seen it, Google it, find it, watch it. It's fantastic. Yeah, here, here. You know, Sean McCauley, uh, a, a name that was one of the few people who got out of that kind of you know mid to late 2000s uh, period of Sheffield Wednesday with any credit because he was fantastic when he stepped in um, in our hour of need and, and you kind of managed the team he was fantastic in bringing together um, a youth team that actually proved to be a little bit of a production line given that it that their budget was about 99 pence per year um and he's, he's gone out there and the Portland Timbers. Can you even believe that a team could be called that? They've only <laughs> gone and won Major League Soccer. So, yeah, I think it's absolutely brilliant to see that um, that everything that he has learned in his time in England, he's gone out and, and it's a major soccer league. It's a proper, real uh, championship of football. Uh, I'm just lolling. I, I didn't know if you're sick or not there, Eduardo. No, seriously. I really, I rate, I, you know, I think the, the US national team have proven that they deserve to be at the top table as far as um, soccer is concerned. And are, I, are you talking about the females or? No, no, the, no, the, the actual males. They've, you know, they've done their bit. They've certainly, certainly proven that they are at least a match for, um, for, for Blighty, for England as far as yeah, I mean, it's, uh, it's a rich vein of talent with, with, you know, David Veer and Frank Lampard. And, and no, Steve no, I'm sure, no. I'm sure the States We're are going to talk about well, yeah. these lads going out there to earn, earn the last big paycheck before they go. But, you know, talking about the, um, the you know, the, not even calling them the grassroots because these are the elite of American soccer. But, you know, these young guys, they are athletes in the same way and they're driven in the same way that, you you know, your young 18, 19, 20 year olds who are playing, um, you know, American football or basketball or all that are. They are all American super stud hero types. And, uh, and the only thing they lack is a little bit of, of old school uh, British Isles nous and, uh, and gumption. And Sean McCauley is one of the lads who can take uh, that kind of malleable plasticine. Of, and turn him know, into a team of Luke Bowdens. Uh, yeah, exactly. A team of Luke Bowdens. <laughs> and in Who fact, want Luke, Luke Bowden himself <laughs> being even better than Luke Bowden ever could be in the UK <laughs> by being Luke Bowden in Florida. <laughs> Brilliant. Absolutely love it. Um, right then, ladies and gents, let's uh, crack on, shall we? I'm going to look at the Wolves game because um, after this one, it, it, it's going to turn a little bit 
difficult, shall we say. Um, uh, this is one we, we really have to bounce back into, isn't it? Um, Wolves have actually got a game on um, a Thursday evening against uh, Leeds as well. So um, they're going to be sort of hopefully still suffering from that, which is uh, I can only assume why that this game has been moved back to the Sunday. Because it's not the telly or anything at all like that, is it? It's just a, a bit of an odd one. Um, of course, Danny Bart, he's been out uh, selling his big issues as well. as a bit of a new story um, that he's been uh, off out selling those. Well, fair play to him, but hopefully he'll be nice and shattered after uh, doing a Sorry, proper day's work. Has Danny Bart been on the same diet as Cheryl Cole? Did you not? Did, I mean, normally Danny Bart, when he was, he was in absolute magnificent shape, but he just he just seemed really gaunt and really thin selling his big issues. I didn't realise, I thought he'd actually dropped out of football and was actually selling big issues on some gambling debt that he <laughs> amassed around Birmingham. But Hashtag no, it, Wolverhampton life, that in it, let's be honest. That's it, as soon yeah. as you get away from the Yorkshire pods, boss, you've had it. That's absolutely right. Yeah, <laughs> Not tweet tweet a picture of him great. to uh, Hulk Hogan, get him to retweet it. <laughs> <laughs> Pray for Danny. <laughs> But, I mean, I mean the, the Wolves, they're quite like us, actually. They've had quite a lot of jaws just recently. Um, they did, uh, I think the last win was against Rotherham, which, yeah, we've all done that. Um, but, again, I, I don't mean to sound disrespectful, and this is exactly what um, James has warned us against saying, but it's really, again, we've just got to win, isn't it? Well, there's a, there's a difference there between uh, a game that we've got to win and a game that we feel we should win. Um you know the the you, you're right, and I, I'm a sort of a little bit pained to say it's a must-win game, but it does feel like that, doesn't it? It feels like we've really got to bounce back because we've got some tough games coming up. Um, you know, we can't expect to be going out and walking these these games. Um, I think we we probably raise our game more for the more kind of difficult teams, and and Wolves I think fall into that category than we do for the you know so-called easy games. So maybe it'll suit us on Sunday. Uh, you're right, they're playing on Thursday, so they're they're going to be a little bit tired. Their, their season has, has kind of mirrored ours quite a lot, and you mentioned the fact that, you know, they've had a lot of draws, that, you know, they've had a fair share of injury problems there as well, uh, very similar to us. So um, it, it's going to be, you know, a fairly a fairly close match to fair. We've, we've just, we've just, we've got to win. Um, I think team-wise, you know, we, we've got to have uh, Wallace in from the start. Sugu really didn't offer us anything. At, at MK Dons, uh, Wallace, you know, w looked a lot, lot better when, when he came on. And I, I think he's another player that we don't quite look the same when, when he's not on the pitch. We need a Hutch, if he's fit, or a Samido to play in this game. Um, and bearing in mind, you know, we've, we've all kind of touched on the fact that he looked quite, quite good last night. I, I think we've got to play Hooper from the start. Um, I think Jow from the bench gives us a real option. Um I, it won't be very popular, but personally, I'm writing off Atty New You now um, after last night. Um, and, and, uh, you know, it makes me sound like a bit of a keyboard warrior, but I, I do just feel I, I'm not really sure what, what he really offers to us now moving forward if we're serious about, you know, making a push for the top six. So I think Hooper from the start gives us the option of Jow from the bench um, would be the way that I'd go with it. I'd agree with that, actually, although I'll defend Atty here. Um, he has a role to play. Uh, Cheeky Nando has said he finds it easier to play and to find space and to be creative when Atty's on the pitch because he takes players out of the game. You know, mainly that's because you know he kind of awkwardly trips over himself and, and runs into them head first. But, <laughs> <laughs> but never, it's, a, it's a talent you can't practice. No, <laughs> absolutely. Practice Hey, you know what? I, I actually, and I've, I've just, I've had a bit of a rant about our strikers, but I actually like the fact that we have um, Fernando Forestieri, who is number one, uh, our biggest goal threat, but also our most creative player. But then we've got those three strikers that, that we argue over. You know, is it Joao? Is it Hooper? Is it New You? I like the fact that they all offer something completely different to each other. So actually, that's where Carlos earns his money. If he picks the right combination of, you know, striker to go alongside Forestieri, or if we're chasing the game, then maybe taking off a midfielder and bringing on another striker. It's, it's those decisions that shape a game. And I think last night, even though the result went against us, I think the decisions that he made shaped the game in a positive way. And that's why I've, I've still got a lot of confidence in Carlos because he does seem to make the right decisions. He, he has a keen eye for understanding when things aren't working uh, and he makes the right change rather than just throwing shit at the wall to see what sticks. So um, 
I don't think that we write off Ati Nui right now. He mm. will have a role to play in certain situations. I'm enthused by Gary Hooper, and I think that it looks like he is going to now kick on and, and come good. And I think Joao, as we've said many times before, um, he's not the finished article, but he is the one that has... He's the most exciting of the lot because he really does have that ability to change a game. So, um, up front, I think we've, we've... It's not an embarrassment of riches, but it's an embarrassment of options. And we have, we have a lot of different shaped pegs that will manage to fit most of the holes that uh, that we find. That's that sounds a little bit Dear shit ever. Dog. <laughs> <laughs> the Wednesday week is proud to be associated with Cavendish Cancer Care. Cavendish is a Sheffield charity dedicated to improving the quality of life for people living with cancer. No one should face cancer alone, so Cavendish provides emotional support through counselling and complementary therapies. The services they provide are free of charge and are funded through donations. If you can help or would like to find out more information, you can go to www.cavcare.org.uk. That's C A V C A R E.org.uk. Um, right then, ladies and gents. Well, that'll just about bring us to an end of this week's show. Before we do disappear, I'm sure that uh, people have seen and obviously heard in uh, last week's outtakes that uh, Victoria had some rather um, cracking videos sent from the uh, from the sponsors, even at Hillsborough. Um, lots of different players, and of course, Carlos himself wishing uh, Victor a Merry Christmas. Uh, following on from her Arati one last year as well, um, there was a few um, that, uh, quite simply, we didn't quite understand. Um, Mr. Padil, um, Poodle, and of course, uh, Mr. Lubens did um, their messages in their native tongue. So if there is any um, sort of uh, Dutch or Czech speakers out there that would like to um, <laughs> uh, translate those for Vicks, I'm sure she would be extremely grateful. What, what would make me laugh is if we got the Daniel Poodle's um, translated and it said something along the lines of, what do you mean I'm not on the list? <laughs> I'm, I'm lower than Carlos. What's the matter with you? If he's a big listener of the show, hi Dan, you're all right, yeah, that's me. <laughs> Well, speaking of, of Mr. Padil, it does seem that there was a rather uh, cheeky tweet sent out from him, or a Facebook uh, photo, shall we say, this week of himself and his good lady wife um, looking rather disrobed um, in the kitchen by the looks of things. Do we think we've got a sort of a, a house of um, free spirits over in the Padil household? I think what they do in the comfort of their kitchen is their own business and they should be free to tweet or Facebook or Instagram or whatever it is, as many photos as they want of it. <laughs> right on my brother <laughs> so yes that will bring us to an end of this week's show uh, Fudgy oh boy cracking to have you back again but if people want to follow your normal Fudgy type nonsense where can we do that old bean um, I'm on Twitter uh, at Dan Fudge um, you know but don't let your kids follow it it's, it's not It's not pretty <laughs> it's really not <laughs> <laughs> Eddie old boy where can people find your nonsense over there on Twitter yeah, so as always uh, at Sausage Arms on Twitter um, I'm hunkering down for, for the Christmas period. So um, you may not see me in, uh, in you know, the, the top VIP celebrity type hotspots that uh, you expect that I'm hanging around in. But you may see me in Lidl because they've got an excellent range of, uh, of Christmas uh, bonbons and, uh, and gifts. So Have we got a new sponsor for this week, old boy? <laughs> no, it's just I've spent all of my money on uh, kids' Christmas presents. And God dang. Now... now <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm got 99p to last me till December the 25th. <laughs> he spent all his money buying Portland Timber shirts for the family. That's, <laughs> that's it's all gone. And of course, James, old boy, where can people find you over there on Tweetage? Um, you can follow me at James Marriott. I'm a bit concerned that I sounded like a bit of a bit of a pervert in that previous comment about Mr. and the future Mrs. Poodle. It, it, it wasn't meant to come across like that. I, I won't be tweeting anything that's remotely pervy um in actual fact for the next 24 hours i'll probably only be tweeting about star wars um however normal service will be resumed as we get towards the weekend and uh, i think i speak on behalf of vic when i say that we'll be in our usual uh watering hole of the riverside cafe uh if anyone is um is passing before or after the match fancies coming for a drink um come and find us say hi we, we may even be with muff absolutely we're waving your new muffs around all over the place old boy 
I may yeah. be bringing a bit of a, a, a disco contingent as well because I've, I've got quite a lot of mates coming on Sunday. So, uh, yes, we need. I think we need to get there early and often in, in order to get seats. Absolutely. Of course, if you want to follow me over there on the Twitter, you can do that at Lord HSL0RD underscore H. If you'd like to follow the podcast, and please do, that's at TWWcast over there as well. Send us an email at TWWpodcast at gmail.com. And of course, you get all of us over there on the Facebooks as well. It's been a pleasure, as always, ladies and gents. Thank you ever so much for joining us. Be good, be safe, and we shall see you real soon. <laughs> No way! Here we-